Hello, friend. This may be just one of the most important town hall academies you've ever listened to. Cash is king. And we're going to go wide open on how to manage cash and how to use it to bring stability and grow your business. The temptation is to automatically start spending $150,000 a year plus, you know, they buy the boat and the RV and the ATVs and get a bigger house and all that stuff. And now when the when, when there's a downturn in the business or they want to grow uh, or they want to hire a technician, but they need to do marketing, there's no actual cash in the bank. Welcome automotive aftermarketers to a Remarkable Results Radio Town Hall Academy. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Hello, friend. Carm Capriato here, the Automotive Aftermarket Podcast Guy. Now, you know my love of audio and the passion to change the lives of others. Now, this drives what we do here as we deepen the connection with our audience to help you make a difference in your business and in your life. A big differentiator in your business is how you manage your cash flow. Tunnel Academy is proud to partner with Shopware. Are you pondering and thinking about your management software? Many shop owners today are looking to upgrade. Now, I'd like you to consider Shopware Shop Management. Shopware is transforming the way shops like yours do business by giving you tools to increase your sales while delighting your customers. Hey, go to shop-ware.com and get all the details. As you know, we recently split our three premier podcasts into their own feed. Now, if you felt that your Remarkable Results radio stream was a bit light in episodes, well, you're right. You need to search for Town Hall Academy and subscribe, and then search for For the Record and subscribe. And you'll be back in the loop once you do that. Hey, thanks for doing this. You don't want to miss one chance to learn just one thing. This episode may just change the course of your business. Now, we're talking cash. It's the lifeblood of your business, and with it, there's nothing you can't do, and without it, you're terminal. So many know and understand why cash flow is so important. Just try to run a business without it. So how do you feel when you're cash poor? A tough position to be in doesn't feel good. And how do you react when the business is generating enough cash to sustain great salaries, new equipment, and even expansion? My panel, Greg Bunch from Transformers Institute and Aspen Auto Clinic, Bob Greenwood, CEO of the Automotive Aftermarket E-Learning Center, and Jeremy O'Neill from Freedom Automotive in Hesperia, California, and president of AdvisorFix. Hey, find the show notes and talking points online at remarkableresults.biz slash A154. Now, this audio workshop could just be your best medicine for 2020. Hey, don't just listen and learn, but implement stronger cash management. It's anniversary time for me, everyone. I don't know if you know it, but today the Remarkable Results Radio popped out our 500th episode. Today. Fantastic. Unbelievable. 154 town halls and about 79 for the records. So we, uh, we're we rocking, we're rolling. It's been great. And I think you'll really like what we did in the 500th Remarkable Results. Uh, I had six uh, shop owners on and we asked them, uh, hey, in the last five years, what's worked and what's not? And and I got to tell you, it was it was it was uh, it was good. It was insightful. It was very transparent. It was also very emotional. And uh, I uh, I shall thank them for uh, knocking it out of the ballpark for our five hundredth. Got a great panel today. We're going to talk about cash, 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 cash. Put your hand in your pocket. If there's a big wad of money in there, it should be in the bank. Remember that. It should always remember that. <laughs> Don't go flashing it around or giving it to Mama to buy groceries. I got a great panel. Bob Greenwood's here. A uh, stalwart here on the show. Yes, nice to see you, CEO of Automotive Aftermarket E-Learning Center. And Jeremy O'Neill, Freedom Auto Repair, Hesperia, California, and president of Advisor Fix. And my friend Greg Bunch from Aspen Auto Clinic and president of Transformers Mastermind. You had a big week. You brought in a lot of the uh, Transformer groups, right? Yes, we had our Platinum meeting, which is all uh, multi-store owners and uh, absolutely had an incredible meeting and uh, I think we counted up. We've added 17 new locations to the family of 15 shop owners and uh, got more on the horizon. So the uh, 
my guys are in acquisition mode. It's fun to see and fun to be a part of. Interesting. They're growing and everything. And Greg and I were on a panel at Apex. And by the way, Greg, uh, that I think we're getting ready to inter- edit that and put that out as a podcast uh, that we oh, did. Awesome. And it was on consolidation in the industry. What, what, is, what, what do we think is going to happen out in 2030? And what do we have to do to prepare? And one of the ways to prepare is cash. And, you know, cash comes from the, the activities we generate in selling things in our business. And whatever is left in the bank at the end happens after we pay all the bills. Sometimes, just sometimes, there's more outlay than there is inlay. And we get into some really, really big trouble. And so I've had this cash flow thing on my wanting to talk about topic lists for the town hall for two years. Glad to have you guys. I think uh, you're, you're perfect to talk about. And uh, I, I, ever since I grew up in business, people always told me, Karm, cash is king, cash is king. And I'm not sure everyone really understood it because sometimes when you get into business and you start generating cash, you say, ooh, 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 look at all that. That's mine. And it's, you know, and if you didn't go to business school and you didn't understand all the ramifications, what's coming after the cash is generated, you get into some big trouble. So, Greg, why is cash king? Well, that's a great question. Uh, because more businesses actually go out of business for lack of cash than they do for lack of profit. Um, and there's a story about two different computer companies, you know, one that spent all the money building the computer, shipping the computer, um, not getting paid for 90 days after they shipped the computer um, versus, the, the, I think it was Dell, forgive me if I don't know the exact brand name, but the other computer company, um, you got to quote unquote custom order your computer, but they didn't actually, they got the money up front. Uh, they were able to build the computer and ship it. And one of them ran out of cash, um, not because they weren't profitable, but because they had all that money extended and the other computer company dominated. So that's an important lesson. It's one of the first things when I had this consulting group come to my company when I started 20 years ago. And I remember seeing that as one of the statistics, you know, being underinsured, being undercapitalized. And at that point, I was absolutely undercapitalized. But, um, you know, always remembering that, that, that more businesses fail because of lack of cash than, than lack of profit. Um, in fact, it, it's funny you mentioned this and we started this out because I've had multiple uh, clients that when things are going well, I say, go get your line of credit. What, what do I need that for, Greg? I got money in the bank. I, go get your line of Trust me, please. Go get a line of credit. Uh, you want to get it when you don't need it, not when you do need it. And three of them at this last mastermind meeting thanked me profusely. Hey, remember when you told me to get that credit line? I did. And I'm so grateful I did because when you when you start growing a business, there's a lot of landmines and you know, $100,000 can disappear really, really fast. So having that line of credit could keep you in business. But let me just put up a warning here. Just because you got the line of credit and it's there doesn't mean you spend it on the wrong things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure we'll be talking about that here today. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about that. Bob, when you take on a new client, do you look, do you look at cash right away? Absolutely. And uh, key ratios in, in the business too, uh, which you want to determine. And a lot of sh- the better shop owners are really doing detailed monthly statements that analyze their business properly. Uh, too many shops just look at sales and their bank account balance. And uh, that's not the right way to run a business today. You've got to look at your key ratios. Where are they? Where should they be? And if I'm not there, what do I have to do to get there? Because cash management is so critical to moving the business forward. And we're not paying enough attention to that uh, in today's business. And uh, remember, and you've heard me say it before, learning how to be a CEO, part of that job is monitoring that cash and where it's going and uh, how you're using it. Now, when you're spending your cash too, a good question to start asking yourself is, if I am using cash to do something, whether it's equipment, tools, whatever, uh, ask yourself, how is that going to help my business this week, this month, this quarter? And if it's not going to help, then don't spend it and, and work it out. Um, but you've got to think about that cash management. And I totally agree with, uh, with Greg to have that line of credit in hand, not using it until it's necessary. And you're only using it because the cash is coming in eventually. But uh, it's all part of the scenario today. And we've got to pay a lot more attention to it. I'm sure you get you can concur, Bob and, and Jeremy, as you work with shop owners across the country, that I'm, I'm still surprised, but, but I'm not right. When we're talking two and a half, five million, six $6 million companies that still literally run their business by the checkbook and they spend when they have it and they don't spend when they don't. 
um, and do not have a strategic approach to cash flow management or investing, uh, you know, lo- looking at what they're investing in, it's just absolute seat of the pants and very scary, you know. And, and I think all of us, when we started our shops, probably started out that way. Um, but holy cow, when you're doing multi millions of dollars and you're still running it that way, that's that's pretty darn yeah. scary. There's a lot of a lot of risk involved with you know, the, the families that are, that you employ and everything else. So I'm, I'm glad you start there and we do too. So Jeremy, you probably, you know, know you know, you're a shop owner and a, uh, and a sales advisor coach. Uh, when did it hit you so hard that cash was king? When you teach and train, you have, have a different mindset in when you're looking at from afar and you're seeing your clients and, and what they go through. And I remember I walked into a client's shop. This is about 10 years ago. And I went to his back office and his desk was literally piled four feet high with uh, legal notices and paperwork. And I was just like, how, like, I, I couldn't even get beyond the mess. And come to find out a few years later, he actually got arrested for some stuff. So it's like, okay, <laughs> it hit me then that, okay, you got to take care of the accounting, you got to take care of the paperwork. But what really hit me today, and you know, I'm a single shop owner with a small consulting company, uh, I found the workshop in the United States and bought it three years ago, literally with not a lot of cash in the bank. I didn't, I wasn't funded and basically had to start from day one to grow sales. Now, what's interesting with growing sales is you can create a lot of cash with sales, but what Greg's talking about as far as the checkbook balance, the way that you run your business, there's an emotional tie to that. And there's three tiers that I look at with cash management. Number one is survival. How many shop owners are simply lost in survival where their daily activities, and I call it the mad scramble to put cash in the bank to cover past due bills, right? You just go to work, you work your tail off, and this is a very hard business. It's one of the easiest businesses to lose money in. If you don't repair a car properly, you got to buy another part that you hope fixes it, and then there goes your profit, right? So, so many shop owners live in survival, and for the first 18 months, our shop was in survival mode. It's not a fun place to be. We've been able to move into stability, which is tier two, which is where you basically know you can cover the bills. You're ahead on some certain things. You're not behind on your bills. You've got your accounting in order. You can look at your cash flow statement. You can look at your profit and loss and really know where the cash is coming and going and how you're making money. And then my goal next is to get into tier three, which is significance, where you really begin to create wealth and do kind of what Greg and what Bob are helping their clients do, which is if you want multiple locations, get into where you're leveraging your wealth and your time and you're not having to invest that time. And so cash for me, Karma, was day one. You know, we opened up uh, the checking account with $10,000 in cash and it went literally, I think in a few hours, it wasn't days or weeks, right? (laughs) Right. Your mind says, I've got this much money. I can last this much time. And then all of a sudden you wake up the next morning and your account balance is a hundred bucks and you're like, whoa, that panic sets in. So cash is definitely king. And like Greg said, it's amazing how fast in this industry you can burn through a hundred thousand dollars literally, you know, really quick. So I love what we're talking about. So for me, it's identifying those three levels, you know, uh, getting out of um, survival stability and then getting up into significance and you can be in stability and fall right back into survival literally in a week or two. Absolutely. Uh, I know there's a lot of shops that have been hurt in December was a very off month for, you know, certain parts of the country. And that's where you got to have your financial house in order to make sure that you can survive those times. Right. So guys, is it the cash in the bank that drives this teeter-totter car count thing that uh, that we, we get into struggles with? The, the cash is a product of your, your pipeline, right? It's how many cars a day is your shop taking in? How good is your inspection process? How good are your sales process? And how many sales are going to actually hit the books today? What are you closing out to keep that pipeline flowing? So there's a flow of money that happens with every shop. And yes, Carmen, it does come down to the cash in the bank, but ultimately it's about production. If I've got cash in the bank and I don't know the disciplines of managing cash, where it goes, what buckets it goes into, what it's obligated to, I spend it. And oh, look at that neat new tool and look at that neat new this and oh, what about that? And I want that and I need this. And and then we end up running out of money to pay for the real things that that top line was supposed to pay for. And that's where the that's where the power of a budget comes in. Okay, so I'm going to say that. No. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> uh, great minds think alike, or broken clocks right twice a day, right? Um, so um, you know, I teach people n- number one personally, they got to live on a budget. And um, you know, there's an old saying in farming: you don't eat your seed. And so you know, and we have all seen this and experienced this, where 
you know, let's say a shop owner starts out as a technician. He was making eighty thousand dollars a year. Um, you know, when he when he started his company or, or when he worked for somebody else, and he goes and starts himself uh, his own business. Now he's living off thirty thousand dollars for three or four years. All of a sudden, he gets some coaching, he gets some training, he builds up his business, and boom, he's making one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. The temptation is to automatically start spending one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year plus. You know, they buy the boat and the RV and the ATVs and get a bigger house and all that stuff. And now, when the when when there's a downturn in the business or they want to grow. Uh, they want to hire a technician, but they need to do marketing. There's no actual cash in the bank. Um, and so, you know, if you're living off a lot more than, and, and that's why I say, pay yourself a reasonable salary for what you do. And for a time period, and if you're in growth mode, because there's an old saying, fast growth eats cash fast, you've got to live on your personal budget. And then that bleeds over into the business where, you know, you we all know that recruiting is important. You know, how many people put 500 bucks a month away for recruiting expenses? Um, marketing is an expense. Um, uh, well, marketing is an investment and an expense. Well, that's, a, that's an argument for a different podcast, but, um, <laughs> you know, uh, buying a new alignment machine, right? You know, what all those things, they need to be strategically budgeted out, not just, um, you know, oh, that sounds like a good deal. Go ahead and sign me up for that. So, um, you know, we can get in, into training, right? You know, Jeremy and, and I both do service advisor training and I actually have a spreadsheet on what, what the value, right? If you're, if you go to send your advisor to training and they increase their average repair order by $50 and their GP by two points, you know, you're going to get a, whatever it is, 21 to one return on that investment, right? Where if you buy some unique scanner that only, you know, for a car that you only see twice a month, right? You may never, ever get your money back on that investment. So that's and my soapbox. You know, <laughs> you, you look at supporting cash, but you've also got to have an emergency fund. And uh, I've, I've counseled clients where a simple little thing, take $10 per RO mm -hmm. and put it into a savings account. And I don't care if it's an oil change, 10 bucks per RO goes in. So if you're, if you're doing 200 uh, ROs a month, you're going to start building that up. You've got to have an emergency fund in place. Because uh, you just never know when things happen. As you said, December, for example, poor month. So I've got some cash built up. And managing that cash is so critical. And understanding your numbers is so critical. And one of the key numbers that I really focus on is the amount of labor sold to the total wage package of the entire company. And that includes all benefits, all wages, management wages, tech wages, service, everybody, everybody. And when you can achieve $1.30 to $1.35, in labor to $1 in your total wage package, your bottom line is going to go through the roof and you will have good cash flow. Too many guys don't even look at that number. So does, I, that, does that equate to 30 to 35% of your total sales? Is that what you're saying? No, no. I'm saying $1.30 in labor revenue to $1 in my total wage package. Just labor. Gotcha. What I just heard is costs, managing costs. And so many times when we run out of cash, it's because we've overspent. Uh, you could all you could argue that the top line isn't strong enough either, but at least, well, there's two places to look, right? And uh, when we had, uh, we, we did a lot of talk on profit first and, you know, basically putting cash in buckets. And the thing that I loved about, go back to the, uh, it's all about budgeting. If you need to pay the bills out of the operating account, once everything else is accounted for, my God, you have to then start looking at those cost accounts and say, what am I paying for uniforms? And what am I paying for this? And what am I paying for that? And good, if cash is king, good cash management is really managing costs too. Right. And Carm, you know, it's interesting. I think there's, there's a couple of different tiers of uh, in the auto repair shop owner. If you're, you know, at a million and a half and below, a lot of times you're a shop owner that's working in the business. And a lot of times you can't get out of the business to go work on the stuff that we're talking about. Like I'm in my back office here and it's interesting for the past three months, we've kind of reshifted staffing again. And for those of you that know my history, I think this is version 22.0. Uh, <laughs> however, <laughs> when I get my hands dirty and I'm touching my tools, my heart bleeds because I know I'm neglecting my duties as the CEO and as that shop owner to go work on those things behind the scenes 
that are so important, but not urgent, right? So we get the time quadrant that comes into play here. So I think it's very important that, yes, you're right. Those are key things. And the other thing that I want to make a point here is this. I think it's very sensitive in our industry right now is pricing. If you're not making enough money, there is enough room to increase your pricing to become profitable. The only thing holding you back is your belief in your worth. I don't care what the dealerships around me charge. I don't care what other shops charge because they don't have my bills. They don't have my staff. They do not have anything that I have within my walls. I have to charge a fair price for what I deliver and I have to believe in my worth. And it's interesting going back on the counter and selling and seeing my mindset sometimes on pricing where I'll short my technician time because, oh, I don't want to be too expensive. And it's just a mindset thing. So if you're hurting for cash in the bank, a simple thing you can do is look at your labor you know, rate, what you're charging labor and increase it because you're worth it. You have a unique, uh, you have a unique team and talent. And the one thing that's going to become more prevalent is customers are checking pricing. I was on the phone yesterday with a customer and he was online and he said, that part is this much, this part is that much. So you have to be skilled at overcoming those objections because if you're not, these savvy customers are going to eat your lunch and they're going to tear your profits apart. I can defend my labor all day long. When I'm selling a commodity, it's a little bit harder. So I'd rather push my labor pricing uh, than the GPL parts per se. So it's there for you. You just got to believe in it and do it. About an hour of our uh, mastermind uh, was that exact topic and discussion. And I'm, I know we've talked about it on, on other venues, but really moving to that model. And, you know, if you're going to decrease your, your parts margin by 20%, you know, how many dollars does that mean you have to add to your labor rate to, to compensate for that? But um, I think that'll be an ongoing conversation in the industry of, you know, who's going to be the early adopters of that. And, and is that really the way we're going to go as an industry? We're in a knowledge-based business today, and it's all about the labor component, your knowledge. And you've got to have the right labor rate based on your competency and what you're producing. And uh, they're not all equal out there. So why is one shop being able to even charge more than a dealership? Because they're far more competent. And their clients know it. So it's not about the price. It's about your knowledge. And one of the biggest things that affect cash, obviously, is accounts receivable. That is the biggest cancer in our industry. And I think people have got to learn how to balance their business properly. And when you're getting into small fleet accounts and that type of thing, you've got to have those receivables under control. But even before you take on a fleet account, you've got to start working out the profitability on the bottom line of the revenue they're bringing in. And I'm shocked at how many people don't even calculate that. They're just looking at the gross sales and the gross activity that the fleet account is bringing in. And uh, if it's not profitable, why are you even taking it on? That doesn't make sense. So I, I think there's some avenues here that everybody can slow down and start studying their business properly, seeing if they've got the right balance, making sure the receivables are under control. And uh, a great guideline in your receivable balance is that it should never ever exceed 20% of your average monthly sales and your average monthly sales are calculated over the last six months. So if you're doing a hundred thousand a month, my receivable should never at any time be over 20 grand. And I'm shocked at how many businesses I go in and I'm looking at the receivable balance. My goodness, no wonder you have no cash. You're out of control right. here. And they're, and, and they're not making uh, money on it. They're not. No, it's activity. Right. That's all it is. Yeah, where did my where did my cash go? And if you're not looking at the balance sheet or you're not running your accounts receivable listings and you're not making the phone calls and you're not pounding your customer to get the money and first of all, how many guys will say never carry accounts receivable? Now when you start doing fleet work or really, you know, you 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 sometimes have no choice and sometimes they'll go to you and say, you know, we'll pay in 60 days. Well, that means what if, if you were doing $10,000 a month for them and you have a parts bill that you need to pay, which is like seven grand, you've got to have the cash to pay that while you're waiting on their money. And there's a, there's a cost factor there. And again, it goes back to um, the sophistication of really understanding how to run a business, why there's value in coaching, why there's value in 20 groups, why there's value in going picking up a night course. I, I'm sure we've all heard the statement, um, keep it small and keep it all, right? People talk about, 
you know, having a small business, but, you know, referencing what Jeremy was talking about. And, and again, I've, you know, built this business literally from my, from my garage, you know, to, to five locations. And so going through that process of, you know, working in the business while trying to work on the business while being a single dad of four kids. And it was, it was an absolute, absolute tough time. And I wouldn't recommend, I don't, I never want to go back to it. I'm, I'm too old for that now, if I can help it. But knowing that, you know, in order to have budgets and performance and cash management and um, all these things that we're talking about, you almost have to get to a certain level or at least strive to get to a certain level where you can have somebody on staff that can do some of this work because it really, it, it, it's an important part of the business. And if you're the shop owner and you're trying to fix cars, write service, order parts, hire a couple of people, yeah. um, and then try and do this stuff at night when you have, you know, a wife and two kids or whatever, man, um, it's no wonder so many guys are dropping out, just going back to work somewhere because that is a really, really difficult stage to be in. And then we, you know, Carm, like we talked about going into consolidation that um, at the end of the day, if your business is that small, um, it's really not even sellable. Um, you know, you're, 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 you don't have much of an asset that you're building. So um, as hard as it is, and there's a lot of training that needs to get somebody to be able to be successful, building a big enough business where you're doing two, two and a half million dollars out of a single location is pretty darn important for the longevity of your business and being able to get into that strategic mode. So um, that's, a, that's a tough conversation. Not everybody agrees with me, but I just see that's where the future's going. Hey, Carm here. And I bet you think of your shop management system every day and wonder if it's time to make an important change, a change to a modern, efficient, and powerful system. Now, instead of thinking about your old system, I want you to consider Shopware, a comprehensive cloud-powered shop management system that gives your customers an end-to-end -end digital experience that will help you sell more services while making your customers happier. And who doesn't want happier customers? In a study of work orders written and shared on Shopware, sharing the digital work order with your customer generated a 12% increase in their likelihood to buy. Now that translates to additional sales in your business. And with Shopware's proprietary parts GP optimizer, you can boost your parts margin with the click of a button and leave behind the pain of managing an old parts matrix. Put solid gross margin dollars back in your business because Shopware puts huge computing power into making you successful. Now it's time. Make the switch to Shopware. Get a free live demonstration at shop-ware.com and find out how you can make more money from happier customers. Last week, I had uh, Bill Haas and Rick White. I know you all know them. And we talked about um, pricing from OE when we buy parts from OE. And the episode, as you could only well expect, went into a million different ways and places. And one of the things that was, uh, you know, b belief in yourself and having the courage and the, and the right value proposition. But one of the, I thought, gems that came out of it was if, if you, are, you own the business, put your technician hat back on and think that you're working for a businessman. That's the key component here, a businessman, okay? And you go out and say, hey, uh, I'm only going to make 30 bucks on this $150 part that's coming from the OE. And the businessman looks at you and says, what? You would sell that 150 part you bought an aftermarket for maybe $299. Now, what are you doing to me by only making $30 on that? Whoa, wrong. I don't need you. Time out. Go. Put yourself in that businessman shoe. Be the businessman here and make the right decisions. And 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 I thought it it was so profound that 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 came out. It's like Rick White's thing. He says, "Put your hand over the invoice, and it doesn't matter where you buy it. It goes into the matrix." What I'm hearing you all say, you need to have a level of sophistication of being the CEO or Bob. But you say that all the time. You've coined that slash business person. So maybe CEO is a reach for some of our owners in our industry, but how about business person, professional business person and, and have the accountability? You know, Carm, one thing that get your accounting in order, like if you can't go access your cash flow statement right now and it's not accurate, something's wrong. Like okay. it's broken. Go fix it. That car is going to crash off the road and it's your business, your livelihood. If you don't have an accurate p &L, if you don't have your accounting in order, you can outsource all that stuff for, for pennies on the dollars of doing it in-house today. It, our world has shifted. So number one, mm -hmm. if you don't get anything else out of this webinar, or what we're doing here, go get your accounting in order, please. Make it a priority. Don't wait six months. Do it in two days, three days, four days. Make it a top priority because the penalties of not having that in order are, are huge. Wait a minute, Jeremy. I have QuickBooks. <laughs> yeah, but is it? That's what I'm saying. Access it. If it's not accurate, it's broken. Go fix it. But what is it telling me? 
Get some education. See, what is it telling me? Wait, hold on. Are you testing me? Are you actually wanting me to ask <laughs> question for you? <laughs> I was waiting for Bob to answer that question. Carl. So, <laughs> I mean, simply put, your cash flow statement is showing you where your cash is coming in and where it's going out. And you should be able to read it and it'd be accurate. I remember two years ago, I pulled and I'm like, these numbers are so far off. This isn't right. There's no way, you know, I think we were doing at the time about 75,000 a month. I pulled a monthly cash flow statement. It showed like $3,500. And I'm like, Something's majorly wrong here. You've got to look at the numbers and it's got to make sense, right? And, and Jeremy, you're absolutely right there. The the issue, both the statement though, is that you've got to measure your business properly. You got to break it down. And I've seen too many shops just go parts, labor, and that's it. They have no clue where their business comes from and what revenue categories are really being achieved. Is it in the fluids, the tires, the batteries, aftermarket parts, both dealer categories, a domestic foreign nameplate, and then the various labor, maintenance labor, diagnostic labor, reflash labor, inspection labor. Uh, you got to know the mix of your business if you're going to generate the cash properly. And when you don't, you're, you're working on emotion. You're working on emotion. And that doesn't I, uh, make business. If you, if you guys look at my Facebook profile, so you got a picture there with Marcus Lavonis, and, and not everybody knows who he is, but he's the, uh, the, the star of The Prophet. And I recommend every shop owner, every business, small business owner to watch that show. Um, and if you have it, you know, what does he always do when uh, he goes, all right, let's sit down and talk about numbers. And, you know, the people that know their numbers, even if they're not great, are usually the people they invest in, the people that start squirming and don't know. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of funny, but in a sad way to watch you know, these business owners that don't have a clue. And those are the ones that he either gets burned on or he walks away from. Um, so mm -hmm. even, even if they're not great, you know, you need to know your numbers. So when I watch that show, Greg, I'm yelling at the TV. Yeah. Marcus. <laughs> don't do it, Marcus. Yeah. Don't, don't do, do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Yeah. I don't and watch that, football, but I'll watch business shows. Yeah, I know, <laughs> and I gotta keep saying, if he buys it, I'm not I'm never gonna watch this show again. <laughs> <laughs> run, Marcus, run. I know <laughs> that's my feedback on it too. Like, well, that's a landmine waiting to happen. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. What Bob's talking about helps you become, it, it's going to guide your business into the future. So one of the things I talk about with service advisors is they've got to get the data to the shop owner as far as profiling the cars that we're working on. What's the demographic of your car? If your average age of vehicle is 15 to 16 years old that you're repairing right now, that's a dying market um, simply because of the, you know, I don't want to get too far involved in the worth of a car and the worth of the repair and all that. But realistically, the demographic of the cars we work on move. The profitability of the jobs we work on moves as well. So if you're really profitable and strong in diagnosing vehicles and you can fix cars that other people can't in your town, well, you can simply market and get more of those cars in mm -hmm. and increase your cash flow because you're target marketing where your revenues are coming from and the profits are coming from. So uh, the other point I just want to share with everybody is, you know, I, you know, um, I admire Greg and Bob so much. I'm so honored to be on this call, but it would be an honor to have one of them as a coach simply because of the knowledge in taking me to that next level as a business owner. I wouldn't even worry about the cost. It's not a cost. It's an investment. So if you don't have a business coach, get one because they will give you insights to things you can't even see right now. Jeremy, I, I can get you a 10% discount um, with either of these guys. <laughs> just just go to their website and type in CARM in the uh, coupon offer. And <laughs> there you go. There you go. There we go. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah, guys, I, I want to I talk about symptoms of, of, of bad cash. You know, so I, I don't have it. And, and I know we can look in sales. We can look in AR and liabilities because a lot of times we'll go on and we'll just go out and lease some equipment and all of a sudden now it's a liability and it's it's another form of cash that I need to have to pay for that. And if I'm not looking at liabilities on my balance sheet and it's creeping up and I'm not quite aware of it because in my gut I think, uh, I got the cash. And then and it builds and it builds, your liabilities build. So you've got a sales issue, an AR issue, a liabilities issue, and a cost issue. Can, any one of you wish to take one of those topics and say, hey, here's how what, here's what you could do to, to be sure Sure, more cash shows up when you're leasing a piece of equipment, for example. Uh, as I said earlier, what's it going to do for my business this week, this month, this quarter? So, if I have a lease payment of 800 bucks a month on something, have I worked out how much it's going to generate for the business on a monthly basis? If it's going to generate uh, 900 bucks a month, I'm at break even. Forget it. This is ridiculous. I got to get my business in place to be able to be able to do that. But 
if I'm spending 800 a month on a lease and it's going to generate 3,500 a month, now I'm getting a return on my investment in that lease. And I don't think a lot of people think like that. They just look at it. We need it, but they don't know how much it's going to generate. They hope it's going to generate. No, you've got to make sure it does generate before you make that final decision. Because that is cash that is there that has to be utilized every month. Well, I see two sides to that. And, and Bob, you're, you're 100% right. Uh, I, I just, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking about when I very, very first started my business, um, I, uh, the shop that I had worked at and managed before, we, we were pretty big on BG products. And I'm not endorsing one over the, over the other. That's my personal favorite. But when I started my business, they had, you know, if you commit to buying a certain amount of product, that they would give you the flush equipment and the, and the tools for half price. And I was scared to death. And, but I knew, well, I couldn't provide those services if I didn't do it. So I bit the bullet. And, you know, my first year in business, my um, BG rep came back and he was laughing at me because we had like done four times as much volume as we needed to, to, to keep our half price deal. So at that point, whether it's a BG flush tool or an alignment machine, part of it becomes, Hey, we just bought, we just spent, you know, 50 grand on alignment machine. You better be asking every single customer, Hey, would you, you know, are you confident in the, uh, you know, when was the last time you had your alignment checked? You know, we have that free with an oil change today or something. So sometimes it's a matter of adding a service to your business and knowing that part of the sales process needs to include paying for that new equipment. Um, if it's really, you know, a good, a good service or repair that your company needs to offer to take care of your customers. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And then with that, Carm, on this on the sales side of it, I think it's important to enroll your staff in the cash flow management of your business at a certain level. Like an advisor needs to understand it, it's not about the gross sale. Gross sales can actually be gross, right? So there are some sales that cost your shop money. And understanding there are certain times where it's okay to say no. There are certain times where you may need to pass on a repair and, you know, making a big sale that goes on ARR for a company that doesn't pay their bills actually we don't want to do that. You know, we're gonna, everybody's going to earn what they deserve. And part of your role, Mr. Service Advisor is to get the profitable sales in. And here's our weekly cash flow that we need. And I love, you know, Bob's idea of, you know, looking at it monthly on the sales side of it, man, it comes down to daily and even hourly, you know, it's, we got to ratchet this up and get the sales into production and get it out as well. So your service advisors have a key role to play in your cash flow management. It's important to include them in that conversation at a certain level. Oh, and that's, more, and, and, sorry, go ahead, Greg. Oh, I was just going to say more and more shop owners that I'm talking to are now looking at the, um, and I believe Shopware actually has this as one of their, one of their tabs along with Typemetric of uh, gross profit dollars per hour. Um, you know, we've been hammered so hard through uh, everybody that, you know, percent, percent, percent. Well, um, what about the, what about the dollars per hour um, versus percentages? And so that's a, you know, it's probably a, a deeper discussion for another um podcast, but there really is a lot more to actual cash versus managing by percentages. And and Bob, I'd, I'd love to hear your take on that because you're in the same world. I'm looking at uh, build hours very carefully and okay. per, per RO. And where should we be based on the mix of business that we are doing, some commercial, are we doing cube vans, buses, whatever, and consumer work. So if you're monitoring your build hours, then we look at daily objectives for the team and weekly objectives. And then you have your morning scrum with the team. Here's where our build hours are. Here's what we did yesterday. Here's what we got on our plate today. Right. And I found that when you're achieving the right build hours, everything else starts to fall in line. And that all of a sudden changes your cash position. But if the build hours are weak, then you've missed a lot of business. And the average shop is around 1.4 to 1.7 build hours per RO for consumer work, and it should be 2.5. And they're not addressing that. What happened to our inspection process? What, how do we change it? How do we mm -hmm. you know, bring it up? And uh, it's a great metrics to follow daily, weekly, with a monthly objective as well. It just goes to show you the value of having a business coach, an advisor, and a c consultant who, who understands these KPIs and metrics will apply what you have to the uh, to, to their standard and then help you live to that. And um, and then never have a problem getting the new F-250 lease because you'll be able to justify it somehow, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so, and I just learned this, not that, you know, for better or for worse, that a Tesla is actually heavy enough to qualify for that... Uh, 
tax deduction the same as your F-150. So no. I got a shop owner friend that bought a Tesla and he uh, uses it for R&D work instead of buying the traditional F-150. <laughs> so. Interesting. And you know, I love one of the points you brought up about percentages, Greg. Uh, in, in my travels, in my life, people said, well, yeah, I bought the part for, you know, a dollar. I sold it for two. I made a hundred percent margin on it. And, and then I do my gross margin thing. And I say, well, it was really only a 50% gross profit right. margin and you're living in the wrong world. And they don't understand that we pay bills with gross margin dollars and, and we don't pay with percent. So the reason our industry needs to stop talking about percentages, although, yes, the matrix is critically important and it's got to have good disciplines. Right. The money that's generated on the sale, the gross margin dollar, is every piece of the component of what cash we have left is if, if the management of the costs is there and I'm not investing that cash in accounts receivable and bad liabilities. Well, when, you know, when, when, we, when I hear people say, well, there's no money in tires, I say, really? Well, let's look at Discount Tire, a $17 billion with a B dollar company. They don't have a crappy location anywhere. They all have super prime real estate, beautiful buildings. Do not tell me there's no money in tires. Maybe you don't know how to make money on tires, but don't tell me there's no money in tires. Um, you know, all of, the, all of the big guys, right? We talk about that in my mergers and acquisitions class. All of them are looking... If you ever want to sell your business to a big player, you better have tires in your mix because they, they are they they make money on tires. They know how to make money on tires. And that, again, that's a different discussion. But um, if so, if you just look at the percentages, you're right. You don't make percentages on tires, but you do make dollars on tires. We're actually going to do a town hall academy on tires coming up. Uh, on yeah, we're gonna we're actually going to do one with with a. Bu- bu- uh, I don't sell tires, and I do sell tires, and try to try to uh, b- close the gap, Jeremy. That's funny because we, we do not sell tires at our shop, but it is something we are bringing in in the next 12 months because of the missed opportunity. And it's just something that, you know, is there. So I do believe there is a lot of money in tires. And uh, besides, I grew up in a gas station uh, selling tires on the drive at eight years old. So it's in my DNA. <laughs> Perfect. I believe in tires because years ago, back in the old family business, we were a big Goodyear distributor. So I, I get all that stuff. I really do. Bob Greenwood, CEO, Automotive Aftermarket E-Learning Center, Greg Bunch from Aspen Auto Clinic, and uh, the uh, president of Mastermind, Transformers Mastermind, a multi-shop owner group. Are you, are you doing single shops now, too? We do. We do. So it's the, the website is actually Transformers Institute. We just, and we, right now we have three mastermind groups. Uh, two of them are a combination of single multi-store owners. Then we've got a platinum group that's all multi-store owners. And uh, we're creating our, we've, we've got a waiting list for probably another single store, you know, smaller yep, yep. 1 million plus group, and then um, another list for multi-store owners. Um, and, and as we all know, there's just not a lot of support and training, A, for people that want to go multi-store or people that are multi-store. Um, and that's where we've come to the market and been able to really make a difference. So I, I, if, if, I, if I was wanting to grow, that's, that's where I need to hang out. So that Absolutely. I can so I can learn from them and Jeremy O'Neill, Freedom uh, Auto Repair in Hesperia, California, and Advisor Fix. Guys, I want to give one last opportunity to to say one last thing here about uh, the fact that cash is king. And you know, let's leave a great little um, gem here for our for our listener who will listen to this uh, forever once it becomes a podcast next Thursday. I'll start with you, Greg. Do not commingle funds. It is the biggest temptation of shop owners. Um, I understand. You know, you got a company car. You put gas in your car, your cell phone. Those are true legitimate things that the IRS is, from my understanding, not going to bother you with. But, you know, people that buy mountain bikes and boats and all kinds of stuff and run it through their business. Number one, they're putting themselves in huge jeopardy if they do get um, audited. But number two, you're devaluing your company. Um, because now you've got to explain to a potential buyer that you, well, you know, all those cash tickets really don't land in the bank and, oh, you know, I put this on, I put this on and it erodes your credibility. It erodes your profit statement. Um, and so just, you know, yes, you're going to pay a little more taxes, but, and I'm not a fan of paying more taxes than you should, but at the end of the day, you know, give, give uncle Sam what's due. Uh, the banks will be more likely to lend you the money when you need it because your profit statements are accurate. Um, it helps you go back to what I said in the beginning of living on a, you know, you have a personal budget and you have a business budget and you stick to it and you you keep from commingling funds. So um, a lot of great advice has been thrown out here in the last 40 minutes, but want to make sure I covered that. Excellent. Great stuff. Appreciate it, Greg. Thank you so much. Robert? You know, holding on uh, to the old business model that I call the old aftermarket affects your cash flow dramatically. 
Um, today, you have to have the right balance in your business. You have to learn how to manage that balance to make sure you've got the right cash flow consistently being uh, created. And I think more owners have got to just slow down and start thinking about their business and getting the numbers accurate so that they can evaluate the business properly. Um, just watching what's going on down the street or with your peers is, is you're different. So know your numbers. Ask yourself, is this going to be a good move for the business this week, this month, this quarter, this year? How am I utilizing my cash? And when you start answering that question consistently, you're going to be making the right decisions for your business. Great advice. Thank you, Robert. Jeremy, I'll let you sum this puppy up. Well, you know, for me, everything begins with a single step. So take action. And no matter where you're at, if you are hurting, uh, go start saving 20 bucks a day and walk it down to the bank and deposit it because it's going to change your money psychology. So whether you're, you need more cash, look at your pricing, make the appropriate changes and then take action, get your accounting in order and then watch this episode again. And all of CARM's 500 for the records because the wealth of knowledge will explode your mind. So take action, guys. Thank you, Jay. It kind of reminds me of that going to the gym. Uh, you know, I got to go, I got to go. Then you go and then you say, hmm, that was good. And then you start going every other day and then you miss it if you don't go daily. Well, oh, remember you're sore at first. So it's like, <laughs> man, I can't buy that toy that I used to buy. <laughs> that's, that's a great point. Yeah, you're, you're very sore at first until you get your cash managed. Yeah. Right. Wow. Then it feels good. You're like, man, I'm not spending any money. This is... Uh, I don't want to drop below this amount or whatever. So it, yeah, beca- right. it, it, it becomes opposite. So, so here it is. Become a cash hoarder. Yes. Yes. But pay your people well. Don't, don't, yeah. don't, don't take it out on your people. Yeah. Uh, we need to pay good people to stay, to thrive in this industry. Very, very good point. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Jeremy. Greg, Robert, appreciate it so much. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time. 